Good evening, everyone. We are to continue in our study in the book of First Kings, and we are now in chapter 5 today. I had mentioned to you that chapter 5 here is going to talk about the construction of the temple. Now, we have looked at the life of Solomon, uh, particularly in the last few chapters, and that describes his first four years of his reign. Now, from chapter 5 onwards, we are going to deal with the, the temple being put together. Uh, and it doesn't tell us a whole lot of information, but it gives us enough details to understand how and what happened to the building of the temple. Now, we may not be aware, but the construction of the temple is a monumental task. It is a, a great piece of work, and it is not just building any building. It is not building a palace for the king. It is really building a house for God. Now, I, I hope that we will bear in mind and put it at the back of our minds as we go through the following passages to appreciate the effort it will take to build the temple of God. It is not like our type of construction today that you could just come together and uh, put a few pieces of bricks or, or, or planks or wooden beams and that will be done. It is not that kind of a building. And in every building, even in today's environment, you know that there is a blueprint. Now, I call it a blueprint, but there is a Hebrew word for it, and we'll look at it uh, shortly. But God gave a blueprint for the tabernacle to Moses. God also gave the blueprint of the temple to David. And so this is what I want to bear in mind and take a look before chapter 5, some background information as to how and what David himself did with regards to the preparation of the construction of the temple. Now we are going to take a look at 1 Chronicles chapters 28 and 29 very briefly. We'll just pay attention to a couple of words, but I just want us to have a, a, a good idea that the temple of God did not just happen because of one chapter in 1 Kings chapter 5, but a lot of work has gone in before this. And so let's take a look at 1 Chronicles chapter 28. I want to take a quick look at 1 Chronicles chapters 28 and 29, and then we will get into 1 Kings chapter 5 next week. This is the background that we all must have in mind before we get into chapter 5 of 1 Kings. This is a time in 1 Chronicles chapter 28. And remember, 1 Chronicles or 1 and 2 Chronicles are the last books that were written at the time of Ezra uh, after the exile in Babylon. They came back to Jerusalem and the highlight of 1 Chronicles were put in place to focus on the high points of the lives of the kings, to encourage the people that they have a purpose to come back to Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple. And so 1 Chronicles are put together with more details than you would ever see in the book of First and Second Samuel, and even the book of First and Second Kings. Now, the, the details that we read in First Chronicles chapter 28 and 29 gives us an insight as to what David said, which is not found originally in the book of Second Samuel, which tells us that some of these words that we are reading are 
probably passed down by oral tradition. And now it's put together in the book of First and Second Chronicles so that the people of the day will be encouraged as to how God dealt and led the kings until that point in time. So let's take a look at First Chronicles chapters 28 and 29. It says that David assembled at Jerusalem a lot of people. These are people that are very important to David towards the end of his life. All the uh, officials of Israel, yesterday we read this, this is Sar or Sarim. These are the princes, right? the princes officials. And these are important people of Israel. These are the leaders of Israel. Then you have the leaders of the tribes. Now, the, the leaders of the tribes, again, same word. Same word. Next, the commanders of the divisions that serve the king. And this word, commanders, same word. Right? Uh, and the commanders of thousands, commanders of hundreds, all right, uh, the overseers of all the property and livestock belonging to the king and his sons, uh, and up to this point, you find that all these words, commanders, commanders, overseers, they are all the same word. Until you get to this, the officials and the mighty men, all the valiant warriors. Now, we have this word, officials. And this is not uh, uh, Sarim. Uh, this is actually the word Saris. Now, the word Saris are, is actually the, the, I, the name that can be used for captains or eunuch. Or eunuch, right? Now, we see this word used a few times. Uh, we see this word used for Potiphar uh, in the story of Joseph in Egypt. All right. Uh, we see this word used in um, in the book of Esther. We see this uh, this word used in the book of Daniel, right? In Daniel chapter one, and 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 it might well be that these will be captains and uh, or maybe eunuchs, in the sense that in the old days. Um, a lot of um, leaders of the armies uh, of important positions were eunuchs. Now, uh, I'm not going to go on with that. Just understand that these words are not the same as princes or officials. Although in the English, it's translated as officials, it does not mean the same. And so I just want to highlight to you that in, in a verse like this, by reading the English, we may not catch the differences in the words. Uh, and that's also because, as I've mentioned many times, the English language writing style dictates that you do not always use the same word all the time uh, in the same sentence. And so it is good English style to vary the word's choices and so you use the thesaurus to find equivalent words. But it's not the same as in the Hebrew. Now, with this, I want to set the background. Everything that is spoken in chapters 28 and 29 is done in public. One of the things that you have to understand is that 
a lot of instructions that is given is it's really not done in private because if it's in private, it will be he say, she say, and uh, who knows the better. And so public announcement and public revelation is the primary source of evidence in the Hebrew Bible. And in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, is also done that way in public. So there will be no ambiguity and nobody will say, no, I didn't hear that. I didn't know that. And so this is David's public announcement. And David rose to his feet, meaning that he was sitting down and then he's standing up. So you can see all these. These are all actions. He was seated and then he stood up. And that would imply that he was probably seated down in his throne, on his throne. And so now he declares these words. Listen to me, my brothers and my people. I had intended to build a permanent home. Now this word permanent home for the Ark of the Covenant. This is a house. That's all it is, right? I have wanted to build a house. Now, I don't know why the English wants to use this, but it's mainly a house. I want to build a house for, uh, for the Ark of the Covenant. And this word here, the house, also means a resting place. Right? Also means a resting place. So a house of rest. So this would be a house of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Now understand the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord represents the presence of God. And so David wanted to say since in uh, 2 Samuel uh, chapter, uh, chapter 6, Chapter 7, right? Uh, he wanted to build a house for God. And so you, you can note this is 2 Samuel chapter 7. And he looked at himself and he has a big, beautiful palace by the king of Tiram, uh, which we will read in 2 Samuel, uh, second, uh, in 1 Kings chapter 5. Uh, but the whole thing is that the Ark of the Covenant is, is in a tent that David brought back to the city of David. And then it says, I want to build a footstool of our God. Now, these words are parallel words, right? A house of rest and a footstool for our God basically is an A and a B. Basically, it's telling us that this is a place where the feet of God, symbolically or figuratively, will be standing at rest, footstool, right? It will be rested. So a house of rest and a footstool is both talking about something that is more permanent. And hence, this is the word that the translator used. But God did not allow him to do it. So you notice, so I had made preparations to build it is a conclusion of this entire passage. God said to me, you shall not build a house for my name because you are a man of war and have shed blood. Understand this? Man of war and shed blood is another A and B. Man of war means a fighting man. The idea of Man of war. And the idea of war is battle. And battle means there is killing. And then the second part here is shed blood. Now, shed blood is a Hebrew expression to take the life of a man. So you can see that Man of war and take shed blood basically says that 
his hands has blood. He's the one who has been in the battlefield killing. And so God doesn't want his hands to be involved in the building of God's house. All right? And so God says, you shall not build a house for my name. And this is in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Yet the Lord God of Israel chose me from all the household of my father to be king of Israel forever. Now understand this. The word choose is important. Bahar means to examine, test, and make a decision. That's all it is. It's a very specific set of actions. All right? Uh, and this is the word here. Choose. And if you recall in, um, in, second, in First Samuel chapter uh, 16, Samuel was told by God to go to the house of Jesse. And so chose me from all the household of my father would be all the sons that were there. And God says, no, this is not the one. And finally, he says, there is one younger who is out there with the, with the sheep. And the word younger means insignificant, unimportant. So in the eyes of Jesse, and when we were studying that chapter, I had indicated to you that David was an outcast of the family. And yet God chose me from everyone in the house of Jesse to be king over Israel forever. Now, this word forever, again, I have to mention, it is to Olam. David is not a person who can live forever and ever. To Olam means a long time, right? A long time. Now, how long? It depends on the context. So, he will be king for a long time. Then it says, for he has chosen Judah to be a leader. In the house of Judah, my father's house, and among the sons of my father, he took pleasure in me and made me king over all Israel. This is a description that God did not make a hasty decision. God examined all the sons of Jesse and came away with David, man after God's heart. And we've talked about that. Verse 5. Of all my sons, and David had many sons, so the Lord has given me many sons. He has chosen my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. Now understand this. Chosen again. It is the same word. God chose David. God chose Solomon over all the sons. There are many sons. And uh, Adonia was the final one, was trying very hard to get to the throne, but it was not to be. Verse 6, And he said to me, Your son Solomon is the one who shall build my house. So there's a house and my courtyards. So this is a complex. It is not a single building. And then I have chosen him to be a son to me and I will be a father to him. Understand that this is 2 Samuel chapter 7. So if you have the time, you should go back and study that chapter as well. Verse 7, I will establish his kingdom forever. Forever is to Olam, for a long time, right? Long time. And we learned that it was for 40 years. If he resolutely performs my commandments, my ordinances as is done now. And so what is the focus in, in verse 7? Well, verse 7 is very clear and very simple, in fact, that God will establish, make firm, the kingdom of Solomon for a long time, that 
if he resolutely perform now this is an english word right resolutely perform literally means he strengthens to do or execute what does that mean that he would put effort into doing the mitzvot right doing uh the mitzvot and the mish uh the 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 mishvot of god right uh as well as the mish part of god that would be the ordinances mitzvot commandments instructions of god basically and both of these is in the torah and we have seen this of course uh, in uh, chapter uh, 2 of first kings uh, let's see is it first chapter 2 yes in chapter 2 of first kings uh, david left word for solomon again right so what is happening in First Chronicles chapter twenty-eight would be uh, before First uh, Kings chapter two, but basically it is to remind Solomon to do the Torah, to make sure that God's instructions are carried out, and then his kingdom will be for a long time, another forty years, as it is done now. That is what David has done. I want us to now take a look at the key words from verse 8 onwards. So now in the sight of all Israel, the assembly of God, in the presence of our God, these are the statements that is being used. And it is important to see this. In the sight means in the eyes. That can be now, I'm emphasizing this is to show you that things are not done in secret. So it is all Israel, the assembly of the Lord. The assembly of the Lord means uh, the congregation of God, the leaders of Israel in the presence. Now, this word in the presence of our God means in the ears of our God. And so whatever is said is heard by God. You see, in, in, in Hebrew, it's very interesting. It's all about seeing, all about hearing. Everything is done in public. It has to be done in public because that is the evidence that everybody needs to have to conduct their lives. So to keep, to seek after all the commandments of the Lord your God, and that you may possess the good land, that is the promised land, and leave it as an inheritance to your sons after you forever. Again, to Olam. For a long time. For how long? For as long as they are obedient to God. As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father, serve him wholeheartedly, and with a willing mind. Now this is what is left. In verse 9, it says, No. Come to knowledge. Knowledge is also via experience. Right? Experience. Learning. Perceiving. And then serve him and work for God wholeheartedly. Well, wholeheartedly uh, literally means uh, a heart. And this word is shalem. By the way, the word shalem, this is a shalem heart. The word shalom comes from the word shalem. Shalem literally means complete. 
that whatever you've promised to do, that you have done it, then everything will be at peace in shalom. And so shalom is really not peace because of a feeling, but peace because everything promised to God or to man has been fulfilled, has been paid, has been completed. And so a shalem heart would be one who would be, in, in, a, in a way, in a complete way to serve God unreservedly. The last one is a willing mind. And this one means everything in thought. Uh, a willing mind is also an eager soul. Okay? An eager soul. And this is about his whole soul. It's like, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your uh, soul, and with all your might. And, and the whole idea is to serve God like that. Right? That's, that's in short, right? For the Lord searches all hearts, understands every intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will let you find him. You forsake him, he will reject you forever. And this is the principle that's left for Solomon. God searches all the hearts, and by heart will be the mind. He understands every intent of the thoughts, which is also in the mind. And so this would be an A and a B. It says, whatever is inside that you intend to do, right? Every intent uh, that you want to do, what, what you want to do as a will, God will know. And so if you search for him, God will let you find him. If you abandon him, if you abandon him, uh, he will reject you. Now, this is abandon. If you abandon God, God will cast you away. You see that God is a just God and God watches how David performs and now he will watch how Solomon performs. And of course, Solomon did very well initially by asking for wisdom, insight, knowledge to rule over the people of God. And that's why uh, God uh, saw that he was with a good intent. Everything in verse 9. Uh, I want to quickly then go down to verse 10. Consider now the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. The idea of a sanctuary, this is a mikdash. This would be a sacred place. A holy place, a special place. So the house is a special place. The advice given to Solomon is to be strong and do it. So this is be strong. The idea of be strong means to be strong-minded. Don't let the difficulty of the job stop you. So be courageous, be strong-minded. Act means just do it. And so it is with these words that David left with Solomon first the instructions. Next, David gave to Solomon the plan of the porch, the building, the storehouses, its upper room, inner room, room for the atoning cover. Uh, that would be uh, the ark, covering of the ark. The plan of all that he had in mind for the courtyard, for the surrounding rooms, for the storehouses and the storehouses of the dedicated things. 
Now, understand this is what I wanted to highlight to you. This word plan. Right? This word plan. The word plan is really a model, a pattern. Right? Uh, this is, I would call it a the idea of the finished product. They're not just blueprints, right? They're not just blueprints. You see, blueprints are just two dimension. In this case, the plan is really the model, right? The model. And the model is important because the model was what he had in mind. Now, this word is not mind, by the way. Uh, this word really means, uh, what should we say? Um, in spirit. Right? In spirit or in the wind. And so I would say that this is really inspiration. And by inspiration, it is God, most likely to Samuel or Nathan. And then only to David. And so that's how God speaks to man. It's through the prophets. And so this is what he had in mind. It's not that God gave it to David directly, but it was given in the pattern that God has always done through his prophet. But the plan is important because it is a three-dimensional understanding of how it eventually must look like in terms of color, material, uh, shape, form. And so it's not just a sketch of how the temple is. This was exactly how it was given to Moses on Mount Sinai for the tabernacle. And so God's house, God's rules. This is to be built by God. It is to be built according to God's design. It is built according to God's requirements. It is to be built according to God's desires, to be built using the materials that God has so designed. So it is not so much as left to David and some architect that would say, let's look at the Twin Towers. It's, it's not none of those. It is not a human design. It is a divine design. And this is something which many people may not understand. So the first temple was done in this manner. And with this, the people who were designing and doing all this will continue to perpetuate the tradition because things would have to be repaired and prepared. And so God says how the priests are to be divided, the Levites, everyone in the house of God how the utensils of the house of the Lord is to be done, the goal. Now, this is what David did. David did not build anything. David prepared the goal by the weight, the silver by the weight of all the tools for the service. So all in all, in the rest of these chapters, you find that David prepared all the materials of whatever is needed. So David did not leave out any tool. So for the golden lampstand, he had prepared the required gold that is for it. For each lampstand, each lamb, uh, the silver lampstand, for each lampstand, each lamb of each lampstand, the weight of the tables of showbread for the tables, the silver for the silver tables, all the implements, the forks, the basins, the pitchers, the golden bowls, right? the silver bowls, the altar of incense by refined gold. Gold for the 
model of the chariot, the cherubim that spread out the wings and cover the Ark of the Covenant. This one is to tell you this. The model, it is a three dimension of a chariot. Now you recognize this would be in the book of Ezekiel. That God is seen in a chariot. And this is the chariot with the cherubim of the wings on the covering of the Ark of the Covenant. How to do all these things when it is now placed into the final temple. Now, all of this is so important. I just wanted you to have a good understanding uh, that David did all the heavy lifting of the preparation. And it says here, all this, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me. Again, it is in writing through Samuel or through Nathan, depending on what is there. And the Lord gave me understanding. Right? The Lord gave me understanding. Uh, and all the details of this pattern, this model. This is important uh, because, how should we say? Um, because this is a very serious and awesome task. It is to be built for God. And so, because David knows God, and then it's passed on to Solomon, this particular task, if you immerse yourself into the text of First Chronicles chapter 28, and later, if you can read chapter 29, uh, you will soon find out that the seriousness that David had with regards to the construction of the temple is incredible. And with all the details, because he did everything short of the actual building of it. He prepared everything that is possible using all the wealth that he had possible, right? With all the wealth he had possible. Again, David tells Solomon, be strong and courageous and act. So be strong. Uh, is to be strong-willed, uh, to be courageous means to be bold, to be strong-willed, and do. Just do it. Do not fear or be discouraged, for the Lord my God is with you. This is so important, right? Uh, that the Lord my God is with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you until, right, this is an important word, until all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is completed. So God is going to be with Solomon until all the work is completed. So what do you see is this? David prepared. Solomon built. And most importantly, God oversee the work. And so because it is God's house, God, of course, being the master of the house, would want to make sure that everything is done in according to his desire. And with this, uh, I, I would want to pause here and not go on to chapter 29, but do go back and read. First Chronicles chapter 29, in the next chapter, uh, 
Uh, and we will continue with uh, 1 Kings chapter 5 next week. But I want to leave with you that the immense work of knowing what to do, preparing every facet, having the entire model, and David communicated to Solomon so that Solomon will also have that model. And by model, it is not just a blueprint. It is a pattern. It is the details of the construction. It is the material. It's how it's going to look like as well but for the function that God has intended for it. Now, with this, um, it is important. Uh, let me just... Um, Maybe just read a little bit of chapter 29. We, I think we can actually uh, end with this verse, verse 1. With verse 1, the king said to the entire assembly, My son Solomon, whom, whom alone God has chosen, uh, and to say alone, this would be uh, Echad, whom the one God has chosen. And I want to highlight this. is still young and inexperienced. And the work is great. For the temple is not for mankind, but for the Lord God. And so I just want to end with this verse. He is young and inexperienced. He is uh, a young boy, a young man. And he is, the word here is tender, right? Tender literally means, you can say inexperienced. I don't think it's wrong to say inexperienced. I would say that um, uh, he he is still uh, weak, not strong-minded. That's why the words be strong, be courageous is given to him. Uh, he has not gone through the, the molding of wars, the fighting with enemies. Uh, so he will need help because the temple says here, uh, the palace is for the Lord God. It is not a human place. And so the work is great. And I just want to leave this with us that when we read chapter 5 of 1 Kings, uh, understand that he is young and inexperienced, but he is smart. Uh, that I think you have to give it to him. Uh, he is wise. He has insight. He has uh, knowledge. But he is weak in his will because he is young. And that is why David continues to encourage him. Be strong, be courageous, and just do it. And with this, I hope that we will have a better understanding that, that everything that is done uh, in chapter 29 as well, is all in preparation for 1 Kings chapter 5. And with this, we come to the end of our session today.